Uh, Paul Taylor. Um, Paul graduated in, in 1959 from the University of Dayton uh, with a degree in geological engineering. Uh, he was accepted into Officers Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island, and received his commission in February of 1960. He attended Naval Aviation Orientation School uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, and then Air Intelligence School in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, upon graduation, he was assigned to VS-26, an anti-submarine warfare uh, flying Grumman S-2Fs uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, Paul was an intelligence officer, but while in the squadron, he qualified for flight status as a naval aviation observer uh, and served as tactical coordinator. Uh, his squadron operated off of the aircraft carrier CVS-15, USS Randolph. Uh, this carrier was the flagship of Task Force uh, Task Group Alpha, whose mission was anti-submarine warfare for the Atlantic Fleet. Uh, this task group participated in several incidents, such as the blockade of the Dominican Republic, uh, astronaut recoveries for Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn, uh, and the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Uh, the group was awarded the National Defense Medal, Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal, and the Navy Expeditionary Medal for service during the missile crisis. Please join me in welcoming Paul A. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I always like to apologize for not being a World War II veteran, but I was only four years old when the war started. But uh, I loved uh, the Navy. I had several relatives that were, were in, in service at the time. So was growing up, I really I, I sort of fell in love with the Navy. I kind of tried to follow whatever was happening in the naval front. And um, when I got when I was got old enough, I just told I graduated from Dayton. I went into Officers Candidate School for the Navy and uh, got my commission. And I was really happy. I really wanted to be a naval officer, and I was happy when I did it. Part of the way I got into this uh, doing these, I I uh, would come to these sessions and. I, I enjoyed them, and uh, whenever we were at sea, if there wasn't anything going on, the skipper would ask me, can you do a talk on something to keep the guys interested? Like, we'd go over to the Mediterranean, you know, you'd, you'd, about eight, eight days over, there's not a lot to do. So I'd do a, a talk on something. And I was kind of lucky because there were a lot of, um, some of the senior officers aboard had served in World War II as they were still around and uh, had been in some of the battles. And I would talk to them, get some information. And, you know, with the resources we have today, it's so easy to put these presentations together. Then I used to have to scramble around and, you know, put pictures up on the wall or draw my own slides and stuff. And with the computer and all that, it's pretty good. Okay, with that, we'll get started. This is one of the battles I, I was always interested in. It's the last carrier ba carrier battle versus carrier in World War II, and uh, it was also called the Mariana, Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, and you'll see why in a little bit. <clears throat> and uh, I told you how I got interested in it because I, I, one of the actually one of the uh, our senior officers had actually flown on one of the some of the runs on this. Thing. Sort of the background of the battle is. Uh, in December 10th, 1941, the Japs, uh, 5,000 Japs attacked Guam and overran our 200-man Marine detachment there. Um, so our object was to retake Guam and the Marianas Islands of Rota, Tinan, Saipan, and Pagan, and give us forward bases for attacks on Japan and, and the Philippines. We got the battle together, the combatants involved. We had 129 warships, 956 carrier aircraft. The Japs had 90 warships, 437 aircraft, uh, carrier aircraft, and 1,200 land-based aircraft. And I'll talk a little bit later about this Japanese Ego plan. The battle was fought from June 20th to June 24th, 1944. So you're looking kind of late. Next slide, please. Here's a, a map of the uh, 
area. Here's Japan up here. Here's the Philippines. Here's the Marianas and Guam over here. So if we had these bases, you can see it's a lot less distance to have to fly to do attacks or do anything in there. So that was our objective, was to capture the Marianas and uh, um, be, able to, be able to strike Japan directly. After the fall of the Philippines in the spring of 1942, the Japs had very few victories and had been losing territory, ships, and manpower, manpower particularly experienced pilots. In, in, by now, the, the Jap mainland was being attacked by B-29s from India, so we were close and we were able to inflict some damage. The prelude to the battle, the Japs wanted one major victory in hopes of, of us ending the war. And that was what they called their ego plan. They, were, they wanted one big battle, beat us. They figured American sympathy at home would, would force them to, uh, you know, for us to sue for, or sue for, for um, peace. As such, they were willing to put up their remaining carrier force against us. So they were down to their sort of their last carriers and their last uh, ships, and they weren't ready to risk too many of them. Here's the Philippines, which, as you know, is under Jap control at the time. Um, these are the Jap forces that will be coming out of there. We had what we called Task Force Alpha, which was to back up and be part of the invasion of these islands. Here's Guam, Rota, Tinan, Saipan, Pagan, and Pargis. But just, we, we didn't pay much attention to that one. Those, these, these were the islands we were after, plus Guam, plus getting Guam back. The major ships involved on our side, we had seven uh, CVAs. The CVA is a large aircraft carrier. It's a CVL, it's a smaller carrier, but the CVAs were the top of the line. We had the Enterprise, the Franklin, the Watts, the Yorktown, the Hornet, the Lexington, and the Bunker Hill. The Yorktown was uh, not the original Yorktown. It was, this was CV, CVA-10. CVA-5 was the one that was sunk at Midway. But when the next carrier came out, they, they named it uh, Yorktown in, in honor of uh, the one that went down at Midway. That was actually the only carrier we lost at Midway. We had seven battleships, the Alabama, the Colorado, the Iowa, the South Dakota, New Jersey, the Pennsylvania, and Washington. And incidentally, the Pennsylvania was one of the ones that was sunk at Pearl Harbor. So it got back up off the deck and came in. We had eight heavy cruisers, the Baltimore, the Miami, the Minneapolis, the St. Louis, the Indianapolis, the Louisville, the San Diego, and the Canberra. Other than that, we had 13 light cruisers, 27 destroyers, and 24 submarines. The one thing we did, I don't mention a lot in the talk, but the submarines were very instrumental in actually pointing out and giving advanced intelligence to the, to, the, to the flight groups when the Japs were running their attacks and things like that. They did, they did a good job. This is our carrier group, the seven of them. It's kind of hard to see the ones in the background. If you could one, two, three, four, five, six. And this. These were the pride of our fleet at that time, of course. If you've never seen a task group, this is what a task group looks like. This is task, task group 58, or task force 58. And, uh, Admiral Spruance was in charge, who was also, um, he was at Midway, he was in charge there. An important it, sort of interesting thing about Admiral Spruance, he was basically what we call in the Navy a surface officer. He wasn't an Airedale. He, he, he didn't have any air experience, but he, he knew how to direct them pretty well. The Japanese forces, they had five uh, heavy carriers, three light carriers, five battleships, uh, five heavy cruisers, CAs, heavy cruisers, CLs, light cruiser, 62 destroyers, DDs, destroyers. And they had planes, uh, they had 25 submarines, in planes, they had uh, carrier base 473 plus 1,200 land-based planes, which are on, basically on uh, uh, the Philippines. So they had like you know, almost 1,700 planes they, they were throwing at us. As I said, Admiral Spruance, uh, Raymond Spruance, was in charge, uh, and he also was at Midway, along with Admiral Misher. Um, the Japanese commanders were Admiral o Oazawa and Admiral Kataka. Kataka was, uh, and we'll get to that a little later, but he actually committed Harry Carey uh, at the Battle of uh, Tinan Island. 
I'm going to go over some of the aircraft that were involved in the, in, in the battle. This is basically became a, an air battle. This was the Jap Zero, the Mitsubishi Zero. That was the Jap's main plane, uh, the carrier base. They also used it sometimes land base. It was basically a fighter. Uh, it, could carry, it could carry a couple of bombs. Uh, but most of the time it was used as a fighter, a fighter aircraft, fighter off of, uh, mostly off the of carriers. They used it sometimes for ground support, but it wasn't uh, designed for that. This is what they call the VAL, it was a dive bomber. You can see it's a little bit old fashioned. It's a fixed, uh, fixed landing here, right here. But it was pretty effective. It did a lot of damage uh, at Pearl, and, uh, at the attack on Pearl Harbor. And it was still you know, a valuable plane to them. The Japs used them a lot. This was a dive bomber called Kate. And uh, it could also carry torpedoes. You can see it's launching one there. And it carried a crew of about three. The gunner back there. And, uh, this is one called the Jill. It was made by Nakajima. It, and it was one of their newest planes. They just had just come into service uh, recently when this battle was starting. This is one called the Betty. And a couple of nicknames we gave it. One was the Flying Zippo and the other was the uh, Flying Cigar. Reason for that was these were built for, for distance or long range. So they uh, didn't have armor plating on them. They get hit, they, 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 they explode right away or you know, they, they, they didn't have any, any protection around the gas tanks and stuff like that. So they were um, somewhat easy to knock down with a, by a fighter. E. O'Hare, I don't know if you've ever been to Chicago O'Hare Airport, you probably have. Uh, O'Hare Airport is named after Edward O'Hare. He was a uh, F-4F pilot in World War II, and he uh, was leading a group, and they ran into nine of these uh, uh, Bettys. He, he knocked three down himself, and then uh, was involved in knocking another five down. They, they got them all, and uh, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. An interesting aside about him, his uh, father was actually uh, killed by Al Capone's gang. <laughs> but he ended up at the Naval Academy and got his commission and did that. But uh, most of the Jap planes, for the most part, had better range than our planes, primarily because they were lighter. And um, our planes, we, we did use pr pr protection on them. We had, uh, you know, armor plating around the, the tanks and stuff like that. Okay, here it is, the F-6F, the, uh, the Hellcat. Just to give you a little background, the, the way the Navy, U.S. Navy, in those days and up till even when I was in, identified planes, they used three letters or three, three digits. First, like this is F-6F. The first letter st stood for the mission, what type of a plane it was. In this case, it was a fighter. Um, six was the sixth generation of that plane from, from the Grumman Aircraft Company. And the last letter, F, stood for Grumman. So if you, if you ever see designations, that F is a for fighter, T is a torpedo plane, B is a bomber, P is a patrol, S is search, and A is an attack. And then the manufacturers like C would be um, Curtis Wright, D would be Douglas, F is Grumman, U is chance fought, M is Martin, and V is Lockheed. In battles with the uh, Jap Zeros, the Hellcat had a 12 to 1 ratio. For every 12 they knocked down, or we knocked down, one of ours would go. So we were at a pretty good advantage over them. You know. This is the FU, F4U Corsair, a fighter, and the U stood for Chance Vaught. Number four, it was a gull wing. You can see the way the wings are here. And it had a huge uh, prop, it was like a 13 foot uh, in diameter prop. And you can, can you see how far back the, the cockpit is? See, uh, see where the cockpit is there? It's almost over the wings, if not go forward. And this one's back almost behind the wings. One of the problems with this was when the pilots came in to land on the deck, they couldn't see the deck. And so consequently, the Navy gave them to the Marines for ground support, and they, they, they always flew off the ground and stuff, so the Navy <laughs> let the Marines have them. They, had to, they made a lot of changes. They finally moved the cockpit forward and did a couple other things and made it so it would land on carriers a little bit easier, but originally the guys didn't like to land upon carriers. It was fast. It was our fastest one. It, 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 it could go up to 400 miles an hour. That in those days was 
That was pretty, that was top speed of anything around. It had 2,100 victories. It, it shot down 2,100 planes and only lost 189, so that's pretty good. It had a 19.1, 19 to 1 ratio against zero, so it tear them up pretty well. There's one interesting battle on this when the pilot was flying this and he got jumped by three uh, um, zeros and he shot two of them down and he ran out of ammunition. And the third one he went after because he had the speed on him, came up behind him and chewed up his tail and forced him down. A little different aircraft, this is a PBM-3. If there's a, de a letter after the, the, the numbers, or after the, if there's a number after the letters, it's, a, it's like a modification. So the first one that came out would be zero, and then, then it'd be one, two, and three. So they, they made changes as they brought this along. But it was a good plane. It was a, the P is patrol, B is bomber, and M is for Martin. It was a C plane, it was used for bombing, and also rescue, to go down and pick up pilots off the, off the water and stuff like that. It was a pretty effective plane, long range too. This is the uh, Hell Diver SB-2C, uh, and it um, came into service a little later. Before being accepted by the Navy, it had 900 defects that needed to be corrected, causing added weight and shorter range. The nickname this crew, the Navy people gave him was the son of a bitch second class. This is a, a Dauntless Douglas. Douglas Dauntless, uh, SBD, and it was like the old reliable. It, it started early in the war. It was one of the planes that was effective in helping sink the four aircraft carriers at um, Midway. It was just a good old plane, reliable, had long range, almost a similar story as I told about the Corsair. It, um, they weren't a great fighter. They, they a lot of times operated with the Hellcats, which gave them a little better advantage, but uh, one of them got jumped by three zeros. He shot two down, and he ran out of ammunition again, and he took his plane and cut the wing on a, on a zero and knocked it out of the air, so they were pretty good aircraft. This is a TBF, it's a torpedo bomber, Avenger. This is when George Bush was shot down, and uh, when he, he got shot down, and he got out, of course, but his crew members didn't. It was a good plane. It was a torpedo bomber made by Grumman. Good plane. This is the battle timeline. Uh, and it started on Friday, February 16th. The first mobile fleet of the U industrial of the Imperial Japanese Navy meets up with the Southern Force west of the Philippines. There was that slide you saw with the red and blue. On Saturday, January 17th, the U.S. amphibious forces elements arrived to take Saipan with over, three, with over 500 ships. Monday, June 19th, the first Japanese raids assaults U.S. Task Force 58 through a combined force of Imperial Japanese Navy and Imperial Japanese Air Army aircraft. The American response has 41 enemy planes down, and the Japs managed to hit on the U.S. battleship South Dakota. On Monday, June 19th, the second raid of of arriving Japanese aerial strike forces identified and attacked by the American Hellcats. Some 97 out of 107 Japanese aircraft were shot down. On Monday, January 19th at 9.05 a.m., the submarine USS Albacore lands a fish, that's slang for torpedoes, into the side of the, uh, the, the, the Jap aircraft carrier Taiyahu. One interesting thing about this attack, the, the submarine fired the uh, first, first torpedo. They were launching planes as, they, as, as the submarine was, hit, was flying in them. One of the planes off the, the, the carrier saw the torpedo in the water and actually took his plane and dive bombed or dived down on it and detonated it. And it didn't hit the, the, car the carrier, but the next, next couple of torpedoes did. Of course, he was out of action after that. On January, uh, June 19th at 12.20, the submarine USS Cavella hits the Imperial Japanese carrier Shokuku with torpedoes. The one thing about that was that was one of the carriers that was involved in the attack on Pearl Harbor. So we, we hit that one. On Monday, June 19th, the third Japanese attack 
includes 47 aircraft, which are met by 40 F-6Fs. Seven Japanese planes are shot down. On Monday, June 19th, the fourth Japanese flight group of 49 aircraft is assailed by 27 Hellcats, netting over 30 Jap planes shot down. On Monday, June 19th, the fifth Japanese attack of 33 planes beats disaster with only seven returning from their encounter with the Navy Hellcat. The Hellcat was one hell of a plane. On Monday, June 19th, at approximately 4.24 p.m., the Imperial Japanese carrier Shikuku suffered extensive damage from the warplanes war planes and goes under. And this was, like I say, the fifth carrier in the Pearl Harbor attack. There were a total of six that attacked Pearl Harbor. And Monday, June 19th, around 4.28, the other, next carrier, the Taiho, joins the Siku. On Tuesday, June 20th, at 4.30 p.m., 216 American aircraft are launched in response to Japanese attacks. American dive bomber aircraft successfully attack and subsequently sink the aircraft carrier Imperial Japanese I Hayo. And on Tuesday, 20th, American Air Forces sink two tankers. And then later, the aircraft carrier Zukuku takes heavy damage from the American warplanes. Tuesday, June 20th, the aircraft carrier Chayoa takes heavy damage from American aircraft. Later that day, during the attack, the American fighter pilots down another 65 enemy aircraft. A lot of this, like I told you earlier, didn't bring it out much, but the intelligence was coming from the submarines. They, could, they were stationed such that as the Japs were coming off, particularly they, a lot of these were coming from the uh, Philippines and stuff like that, so the submarines were spotting them passing the word on and giving us the advance intelligence. <clears throat> By 8.45, the American attack shows a loss of 130 aircraft, with 80 being lost to landing accidents or lack of fuel, forcing many airmen to ditch in the sea. On Tuesday, June 20th, the Japanese losses were significant, with 750 planes shot down, of which 500 were land-based and 250 were carrier-based. And that's why the battle became known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. In one of the debriefings after the, the battles, the, the pilot said it was just like an old-fashioned turkey shoot back home. And that's, how, that's how this got its name. Okay, the reason for victory were, were several. One was the American pilots were better trained. What we did, we sent back our flying aces, like I mentioned, Edward O'Hare, after his first encounter, and he, he was successful, brought him back to the States, and he helped train new pilots, which, which made sense. The Japs didn't do that. We had a, a number of others that, that came back and were, were in training. Um, they did not send back their new pilots. We, ha we had enough resources to allow for the training, too. Um, the Jap lost many experienced pilots through attrition. Uh, we had, you know, did a good job at, at Midway, and this was two years later. We kept winning most of the battles. And, um, a lot of the Japanese pilots that we were going up against had less than 50 hours of flight time, which is barely enough, and I'm not a pilot, but barely enough to get your, your flying license if you qualify in this state. So they were pretty inexperienced. And we had the, of course, we had the F-6F. Corsair was supposed to be our plane, the, the, the number one plane, but because of the problems with it, they, they, they rushed the F-6F into production and, and just kept building them and building them and building them. Grumman it was the designer and the builder, but they also were built by General Motors and some of the other major companies. Um, and we had a lot of F-6F, six, F six it was just one, one great aircraft. We also had some other technologies like the proximity fuse and things like that. But the technology was on our side, and, and we, had the, uh, we had the resources with which we could you know, put them out there. This shows you the difference between the F6F and the, um, the, the Jap Zero. As I say, the F6 was made by Grumman. They carried a crew of one, 33 feet long, versus the, uh, the Zero was 29, was a little bit bigger. It had a Pratt Whitney 2800, 18-cylinder uh, rotary engine, and the Nakajima uh, Zero had a rotary engine, 12-cylinder. The Zero, 22 horsepower with a supercharger versus 960 for the uh, Zero. 
The max speed on the uh, Grumman was about 91, or 391 miles per hour, whereas on the Mitsubishi, it was about 332. Now here's a big difference, not loaded. The, the Grumman weighed 9,238 pounds, whereas the Mitsubishi weighed 3,764 pounds. So it was almost three times as heavy as it was, and the biggest difference was armor plating. And then loaded, you can see the Grumman could go up to 12,000, and the Mitsubishi could go up to 6,000. The Grumman had six 50 caliber machine guns. It could also carry bombs, torpedoes, and rockets, whereas the Mitsubishi had two 7.7 millimeter, which would be about a 30 caliber, two uh, 20 millimeter uh, cannons, and it could also carry two bombs. The Hellcats had a ratio of 12 to 1 over uh, um, zeros for survey 12 we we knocked down they might get one of ours so it was a pretty good ratio the, I'll show you how good the Hellcat was it, it claimed 5,233 enemy aircraft or about 80 percent of what was shot down in the Pacific during the war so the Grumman was that was one hell of an airplane before that we had the, what they called the F4F which was called the Wildcat and it was a pretty good plane but it wasn't as fast as the Zeros, and uh, we had to use some special tactics to, to stay in with them. But when we came out with this, we, we kind of took over the air superiority. The Japanese lost two heavy carriers, another heavy carrier heavily damaged. Um, they lost a, a light carrier, then two other he light carriers heavily damaged, one battleship damaged, the heavy cruiser damaged. Two tankers sunk, 17 submarines lost, and 750 planes shot down. See, we had the, the battleship South Dakota, had some damage, it, it came back to fight again. And we lost 130 planes, About 80 of them were ditched. It didn't mean they couldn't get back to the carrier. Like I told you, they had the, the range on us, and they were, of course, they're, you know, they were fighting, we were fighting a long way from where we were. So they had the range on us, and a lot of guys couldn't come back, I know Admiral, Missioner one night, they were coming back late, and usually you land in the dark, but they, he turned the lights on so the guys could come aboard, and still we had some, you know, crashes on landing and stuff like that. But most of the planes, we, almost all the planes we lost for the most part were, were because of uh, fuel or accidents. Down here you can see 45 that, were, that didn't make it back were those uh, SB. Two C's. You remember what that said, <laughs> and that all those modifications they did. It just didn't have the range. The Douglas, as I talked about, all of those that were out made it back. They didn't lose a one of those to thing. They're just a good old thing. And that SB two C was supposed to replace the Douglas. So the Douglas, is an old timer, just stayed around and did its job. Some famous people that participated. One was uh, George Bush, our first, the first Bush president, um, and he. He was in the TBF Avenger, uh, participated as a member of a VT-15, V, V, in the Navy, uh, V, all the squadrons start with a V, which is aircraft. So V, and then T was a torpedo squadron, 51, flying off the CVL-40, uh, USS San Jacinto. Bob Feller, a chief, was a chief petty officer. Anti-aircraft gun captain, a 40 millimeter battery on the USS Alabama. Another one was he wasn't involved in the battle, but uh, he was a uh, flight instructor for the Corsairs. Was Ted Williams? He actually uh, did that during World War II, and then in Korea he actually uh, flew some battle or missions with the uh, Corsair. There's some interesting things happened. There were mass suicides, including civilians and late surrenders uh, after, after Japan surrendered. One went 20 years, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. This thing was called Suicide Cliff. It was on the, on the island of Saipan. And Saipan had been a Jap possession, so there were a lot of native Japanese living there, some 25,000. Um, we attacked uh, um, to take the island back. Uh, Hirohito, they were losing even gave a directive to tell people not to surrender, to, to commit suicide. They thought them would go to this place here, the suicide cliff, and jump off. Um, or they would uh, get the family in a circle and uh, um, get a hand grenade and pull the pin and, 
destroy the family. This is another place on side pans called Bonsai Cliff. They call it that because as they, as they jumped off there, they would yell Bonsai. Japanese soldiers told the civilians that the Marines were very bad people. It was the only the way to get into the Marines, you had to be a convict first. And they also told them that they were cannibals. And uh, so they poisoned the minds of the people and um, there wasn't much we could do. It, the way they would do it off the cliff here, they would line the family up, the youngest person first, next older behind, and so on and so forth, and push the one in front of you off until you got the last and the father would jump. And there were probably about 13,000 suicides on Saipan alone. Some, there's, there's been figures all over the place on that, but it, it, more, more research showed it was about 13,000 that committed suicide. And down at the bases of these cliffs, there was you know, just bodies littered, and it caused a lot of problems with bugs and stuff. And they had to, to wash down the planes. There were some people, actually, some of the that tried actually made it into the water, and our, our plane or our ships picked them up, but not too many. The results. Uh, the Jap suicide commanders, soldiers, and civilian people, many of them committed suicide. The last Japanese capture was in 1972 on Guam. There was one individual who was uh, holding out on Guam, and they, they had him uh, surrounded. He still wouldn't surrender. They finally had to bring over his command. This was like 10 or 12 years after the war. They finally had to bring over his commanding officer after, you know, 12 years. He had to come and tell him it was okay to surrender. And he finally did. And the guy that, uh, that it took 20 years to, retire, to, to surrender, he ended up going to South America and became a very successful farmer. The Imperial Japanese Naval Air Force, practically nil, they're no longer capable of full-scale warfare. We had really whittled them down, you know, over all the battles. So, um, of the 473 air carrier aircraft at the beginning, the Japs had 35 left. Their surface forces were severely weakened. We had forward bases to hit the mainland of Japan as well as bases to hit and recapture the Philippines. The island of Tinan that I have in parentheses there, as an aside, that was where our two, air, or two um, B-29s took off that dropped the atom bombs on uh, Nagasaki and, and uh, Hiroshima. It kind of gives you what it was like. This is a jet plane being shot down over the carrier. You can see the carrier here with the plane's wings folded, but uh, it was a pretty good, pretty good victory for us. And uh, it was, Midway, this one, and then three months later, we had the Battle of um, Surigawa Straits, where we basically took out the Japanese Navy in, in all practical purposes. Yeah, the Randolph, actually, the Randolph was a World War II carrier, and it, it, was, it started out as an attack carrier, uh, and it took a kamikaze in one of its first battles, and uh, they brought it back, and um, it was, you know, we refitted it and stuff. I was, uh, I was a lieutenant JG, and I was the intelligence officer for our squadron, it was called VS-26, and my job was to brief the pilots as they went out on missions. If you ever see the movie, uh, The Right Stuff, uh, about the astronauts, and sort of the closing scenes, there's a ship, Going down in an aircraft carrier in the water, and a view from up top, and there's a 15 on it. That was the Randolph. We we participated in almost at least all the first uh, pickups of the uh, things. The helicopter is actually the ones that picked up Grissom. Carriers, a lot of them are scrapped. Um, a lot of them got refitted, like uh, you say, the Randolph. The, um, USS Essex, uh, what was it, what's one in New York, the Intrepid, uh, that's actually a museum in New York, it's uh, one of the piers in New York, at USS Intrepid, I think it was. No, he, he was killed on one of the, um, after he came back, he was flying F-4s, and then he went to the States, and he did kind of a, you know, goodwill tour, for selling bonds and stuff like that. Then he came back and he was commander of a squadron. And um, they, were, they were flying 6F, F6Fs now. 
in. They were doing a special mission. It was a night mission, which they hadn't been doing much of. And he went out with the group, and uh, they ran into some of those Bettys and we took them on. And it, 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 there's no clear answer to what exactly happened to him. He went down. They think he got hit by one of the Bettys. And um, there were some other that, that, that he, you know, it's one of his wingtips hit the water. They were flying low level at night. But I don't think that was true. They never found him, never found his plane. But he was, uh, you know, one of the best pilots we had. And uh, his skipper was a guy called uh, Thatch, Admiral. He became an Admiral, Admiral Thatch. And he developed what they call the Thatch Weave, which made the F4F competitive with the, uh, the Zeros. But if they came in regular, in those days too, you don't forget your carriers were straight decks. Was if you missed the, the, the hook, you, you know, you went into the aircraft that was sitting up in front of the plane, whereas you know, the new aircraft carriers are modified, have the candid deck, so you do what you call a touch and go. You just put the power to it and you go back up. But uh, in those days, it was, uh, it was a straight deck, and uh, it, a lot of times there were planes up, up front. And there was a big barrier, but she crashed into that. It was just like crashing. <laughs> It was tough, but uh, it's amazing what we did in that battle. I mean, that um, the sea battle uh, just uh, totally knocked the Japanese uh, Navy uh, for a loop. And, uh, and from then on, they, they just, you know, they, they really never tried to take us on again, except uh, the Surigara Straits. Uh, they tried something, but they, they were, you know, we had them so, so far down. You know, they did. They just didn't have any air superiority after that, none whatsoever. And, you know. Because of that battle, then that MacArthur was able to return. To yeah, they. That was one of the main reasons was to, you know to get the bases so they could uh, attack the Philippines with more force than than just ships off the. What happened when they started? Uh, you know the aircraft. Uh, became so important in the war, they started um, converting ships. If they were building a transport and uh, it was far enough along, they would f throw a flat deck on top of it. And the idea was that, you know, you could take off from it and land, but they could also transport aircraft. And a lot of the Jeep carriers and things like that were like backups to the, you know, to the, to the main attack carriers. They, they, would, they could carry airplanes, and their planes could take off, and then, they, you know, you got into a bad situation, you needed more aircraft, the Jeep carriers would supply it. They also used them, uh, like, for ground support. They were basically a smaller aircraft carrier, and a lot of them were built that way. They were tanker hulls or uh, uh, hulls like that, that that had been started for transport ships, and they, they put a flat deck on top, and you have to give our people credit for it, and they were good planes. And, I like say we had the resources to train the pilots, and uh, it made such a difference. It really did. Um, the other thing is, I'm just, another one, when they were, you know, the Japs after this started coming up with the kamikazes, and they actually used them at the Battle of Surigara Straits. And the Japs um, built the kam were actually They were using some of the older planes for kamikazes to begin with, but then they found out, well, we, we should use these things. We could be effective. They started building them without landing gear. They had a um, like a carriage that fit underneath so they could take off, and they dropped it after they were coming back. And uh, I thought that was funny. You see our boys trying to do that. But um, they did. They had, they built, I mean, like, when the war was, was ended, they, they still had like 4,000 or something like that kamikaze planes that they were going to use if, if we attacked Japan. So, well, I thank you for your support. Oh, thank you very much. As a, as a small token of our appreciation, appreciate it. This is, I think this is a library survival kit. We got a flashlight, <laughs> I see it. Cup and everything you need there. I'll so use it. Thank you Thanks very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank you.